Hello and welcome back to the Manufacturing Culture Podcast. I'm your host, Jim Mayer, and boy, do we have a powerhouse of a guest today. But before we dive into the world of lean manufacturing and cultural transformations, let's take a quick moment to remind you to visit us online at manufacturingculturepodcast.com. Stay connected with all of our latest episodes and exclusive content. You can find us buzzing with ideas also on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. And hey, a huge shout out to our sponsor, Speroni, for their unwavering support. They truly understand the heart of manufacturing. Now, let's get down to business. Today's guest is someone who's turned the tables in the world of manufacturing. After a stellar 20-year career with Chevron and refinery management, Lonnie Wilson took a bold leap and founded Quality Consultants. But he's not just a consultant. Lonnie is a lean manufacturing maestro, a guru of respect for people, the cornerstone of the Toyota approach, and what Lonnie likes to call workforce engagement. Are you struggling to make that big cultural shift in your organization? Have you tried embracing lean principles but have hit a roadblock? Lonnie's your guy. He's a beacon of hope for firms grappling with transformation and a guiding light for those who've stumbled in their lean journey. Lonnie isn't just about practice. He's also a prolific author with six books under his belt, published in three languages, no less. He dives deep into the theory and application of lean strategies, tactics, and skills. And for those of you passionate about workforce engagement, Two of his books focus solely on this vital topic. I know I'm going to have to check them out. Lonnie, I'm sorry I haven't yet. Are you eager to learn more? Jump over to qc-ep.com where Lonnie's treasure trove of knowledge awaits. All of his materials are in Excel and Word format ready for you to download and revolutionize your approach to lean manufacturing and workforce engagement. So without further ado, Let's welcome the lean legend, the cultural change catalyst, Lonnie Wilson to the Manufacturing Culture Podcast. Lonnie, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for taking the time to be on with us today. How's your day so far? Oh, no, thank you. I uh, I enjoy this. This is one of the things I want to do. I'm I'm kind of of a retirement age and <laughs> and uh, I'm at the point where I'd, I'd like to share some of well, my experiences, the successes and the failures. So. So Absolutely. Thank you for giving me that opportunity. Love it. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, you may be in retirement age or close to retirement age, Lonnie, but uh, you're still a busy guy. So I appreciate you taking the time out of your day. Uh, Lonnie, typically I start with our guests uh, where uh, when they're leaders of manufacturing organizations internal, uh, I asked them to share the cultural journey of the organization, um, where they were, where they are now, where they're going, uh, where they want to get to. But I want to focus on you in, in this segment. I really want you to tell us about your journey um, when you were with Chevron to starting Quality Consultants. Uh, what motivated you to, to make that jump and, and uh, how was working for an organization like, like Chevron? Well, my, my lean journey and my journey into, into cultural change was interesting. It, it was a pure, it was just pure luck, to be honest with you. <laughs> I had been with Chevron for about 10 years and I was transferred to El Paso. And here in El Paso, it's a smaller refinery. So okay. just by definition, I was higher, I was further up the hierarchy. And um, to put it in perspective, um, even though it's what people would call a small refinery, it's a big business. Uh, at that time, well, at this time, its sales are a tad over $4 billion a year. So that's billions with a B. Um, wow. And of course, it goes up and down with the, with the price of oil. But uh, this is not a, a, a small enterprise. There's, there's only uh, about 350 full-time employees at the refinery. Oh, wow. But, uh, but the cash flow is just phenomenal. So the opportunities to learn and the opportunities to improve are just immense. Yeah. But um, I had been involved in, in, in refining for about 15 years. 
and then uh, a vice president of manufacturing at a at a at a cocktail party met a couple of people from San Francisco who dealt in cultural design. Okay. And he gave the refinery a call and he says, hey, these guys talk a great game. Uh, is it something we should explore? And so we became kind of a test site for Chevron. And these people came in there and their key was cultural design, cultural design and redesign, cultural yeah. evaluation and redesign, I should say. And uh, three guys off the chart bright, really <laughs> intelligent. And... Um, so they came in and they started working with us. And man, I immediately saw the impact that you could get by doing this. And sure. they worked with us for maybe four or five years. And, and you could see the change in the refinery. Well, then actually Chevron wanted to transfer me and I didn't want to leave El Paso. And that's why I retired. And really? so when I retired, um, I had thought about leaving Chevron for some other reasons. And I said, okay, well, if I did, what would I do? And I said, well, I'll be a consultant. And I said, in what field? And I said, well, what about cultural change? That sounds like a cool thing. At that point in time, when I left Chevron, it was 1990. Okay. And uh, I had had five or six years of teaching from Deming's philosophy. Mm -hmm. uh, I had t attended his workshop, uh, worked with dozens of people that were worked very closely with him. I chatted with him on occasion. I never worked with him on a project. But, but uh, I got to embrace his philosophy. And I said, well, this is it. This is the culture change that I want to, to create, transforming firms into so that they were in, in harmony with Dr. Deming's 14 obligations of management. And so when I left Chevron, that was my approach. Sure. And, and, but I, I needed to learn more about it. Okay. And what I found out was there wasn't much out there in the literature. And yeah. in 1990, the, the internet was in its infancy and you couldn't get much out there. Right. Uh, web crawler was, I think, the biggest search engine. And although maybe Yahoo came along about that time, yeah, maybe. but there wasn't a great deal of information. So I said, "Where can I go get some information?" And I was able to find two authors that had, had published some really good stuff on cultural design: um, uh, Edgar Schein out of MIT, and uh, two guys who had their own consulting practice, Deal and Kennedy. Okay. And so I, I started reading that, and and it all made sense. But I said, "I want more." But it wasn't there, so I, I I talked to my buddies from the from the um, the consulting firm who were now I was outside of Chevron at this time, but yeah. still had a relationship with them, and and they said, well, you know, we sometimes read about families, and I said, interesting, you learn about business culture by reading about families, and so they recommended a book, and I read it, and I said, this is great, you know, the the correlations and the metaphors that you can come up with just phenomenal. And um, so I started studying family design, and the, the guy I spent the most time with was Bradshaw. Okay. And uh, he's got, he had a whole bunch of books and was pretty well respected at the time. And I've lost track of what's happened. Uh, I'm not even sure he's alive anymore, but, okay. but um, it was great learning. And so then I went out to practice my trade, and boy, I could find clients like nobody's business. Um, and they were really fun to work with until you wanted to do something. And as soon as you wanted to change the culture a little bit, it was, well, we're really not ready for that, or we don't want that, or that's too much, or whatever. Yep. And so uh, I tell people that my initial journey into cultural change uh, out in the real workforce went over like a pregnant pole vaulter. I mean, <laughs> it just, it didn't fly at all. And uh, so I was, I was well-versed and had, had, had done a lot of practice in small group problem solving, things like quality circles. And I was pretty sharp in statistics. So I started teaching small group problem solving, small group statistical problem solving. And I would use that as an entree to get into the business. And then we'd small, solve a small problem and somebody would say, well, does that work over here? And so we'd, we'd expand it. And pretty soon we were in the plant and pretty soon I was in the plant manager's office. And he said, well, you know, maybe we need to change some things, you know, and, and we'd start working on cultural redesign at that time. I Got used it. to say my fifth visit to the, to the plant was to the, to the plant manager's office, you know. <laughs> and so I used that as a as a as a uh, hook to get involved in the business. Uh, later, um, the the big cultural change mechanism that that hit the industry was lean manufacturing. Womack and Jones published the book, The Machine That Changed the World, and they yeah. started the Lean Enterprise Institute, and and all of a sudden there was just this wave of, of lean that was flown out there. 
And uh, most people saw it as a, as a way to teach better manufacturing. I saw it as an entree to cultural change. And so I became a lean manufacturing consultant. And in fact, if you do it like Toyota does, it is a strong cultural change mechanism. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then I, as as I got involved with it, I said, well, the the Toyota production system really has two major pillars to it. One is the technical pillar of continuous improvement, and the other is the human pillar of respect for people. Yep. And what I found out was that what people were doing was they were spending ninety percent of their time on the technical part and 10% of their time on the human part. And I said, this is upside down. This makes no sense. It should be the other way around. After all, yep. aren't all your people doing the stuff? But getting the people to do it differently was a large cultural change. Getting the techniques changed a little bit was a small cultural change. And so, um, and, and that's why my books took the shape they did. First, I talked about lean manufacturing in general. And my last two books have been about the human side only. Got it. And uh, I find if you take care of the human side, you take care of everything. And so that that's kind of my journey into, into culture. And, and that's where I am, I guess what you'd say today. So uh, how, in your experience, I mean, you're, you're a very storied uh, careered person here. Um, how has the historic approach to cultural change been in the manufacturing industry and and where do you see the biggest gaps well i put together a slide pr presentation and we can we can talk about that that very thing okay but in summary in summary let me kind of give you the reader's digest version um the cultural change precisely how the top management changes yeah there's there's three types of there's three key elements to the culture and one is the history, which you really can't change. Right. And the other is the external environment that you're operating in. Um, and, and the third thing is the few top people at the top, the few yep. people at the top. Those you can change. And so if you want to change the culture, those people have to change. They have to lead the change. They have to be, they have to model it. The biggest problem is they want to orchestrate the change, but they want everybody else to change. Sure. Okay. And, 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 it's always a an uphill battle to convince them that they need to lead it. They need to model it because what's going to happen is people are going to follow their behavior. Yeah. And um, so if they're always coming in late for work, everybody else will come in late for work. Absolutely. If they quit wearing suits and ties, everybody else will dress casually. You know, I mean, it's yep. it's not rocket science, but it is difficult to change. And and to me, that's the the biggest hurdle. Okay. I read uh, not to detract from talking about manufacturing, but I did read one time that JFK killed the hat um, because he was the first president uh, talking about how leaders at the top drive change. Right. Uh, he was the first president to speak in public outdoors without a hat on. And from then on, <laughs> it, it, men stopped wearing hats outdoors during the day. So uh, I, I think it's fitting to, to your anecdote there. Um, Lonnie, before we jump into your, your slideshow, and I, I love that you prepared one. Um, uh, I, I saw a, a couple of the slides, but I'm excited to dive into it. First, I want to I want you to explain um, the the respect for people concept a little bit more because uh, I don't know how many of my listeners understand the Toyota approach completely and, and exactly how respect for people uh, transforms that manufacturing workplace. Well, the, the respect for people concept is, is grossly misunderstood in a general sense. Yeah. Uh, those people who are deeply involved in the Toyota production system get it. Okay. But most people think it has to do with treating people fairly, about being polite, about being humane, and it's all of that. Okay, sure. And 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 those are what I call necessary but not sufficient conditions. Yeah. Okay. The the Toyota respect for for people concept has two other I would call them major elements involved, and one is designing a workplace and creating an atmosphere where people can actually perform, where they can, okay. where they have all the resources they need. The work instructions are good. Uh, they have the support that they need. And so if, if a problem comes up, somebody can come help them, you know? 
Yeah. And so that's one thing, so that they can perform and enjoy their job. Dr. Deming said everyone has a right for joy in their work. Okay. Yep. The third part of it, besides the the manners kind of stuff, you know, and, and common sense. Yeah. Um, and and besides the creating a work environment where they can perform, the third part is to create an environment where they can become the best version of themselves at work. Hmm. It's about drawing out infinite possibilities in the worker. Yeah. Can you can you take these workers and transform them into whatever they would like to become? Interesting. And, and let me give you an example. This is very uncommon. And when I first heard this, I was really surprised. But my mentor is a fellow Toshi Amino. And Toshi is, is currently living in Japan because his mother-in-law is sick. But he, he used to spend six months in the state and six months in Japan. Okay. In 1998, Toshi retired from Honda Corporation as the vice president of human resources. And I was lucky enough to run across him, and we hit it off great. And so he's been mentoring me for the last 10 years. Uh, actually, 13, I guess. But um, when when I was, I was talking to Toshi about all of this stuff, uh, I ran across just a jewel. And, and he said, he said, well, you know, we have a lot of engineers who are not degreed. And I said, what? I said, how do you have an engineer that's not degreed? You know, <laughs> that's almost by definition. They have an engineering degree. That makes them an engineer. Yeah. He says, oh, no. He says, within Honda, we have a, a, a relatively large group of people that have exhibited the skills to be an engineer. So they're in the engineer salary system, the engine, engineer promotion, promotion system. And I said, well, how many of them are there? And he said, oh, I don't know. I really don't know. And he said, well, maybe, maybe 30 percent. And that's a and massive amazed, amount. Right? I had exactly your reaction. And um, you just don't hear that in Western society. You don't hear that in the United States. You don't hear that right. in Canada. You don't hear that in South America. You yeah. don't hear that in Mexico. Engineers are engineers, you know, and they're a, they're kind of an elite little group that have their own criteria. Yeah. And one of the things is they all have a sheepskin. But but not in Japanese society. If you can exhibit the skills that it takes to be the type of engineers they need, they make you one. Okay, so that's wow. a, kind of a manifestation of how they work to to get the most out of the people and allow them to grow to their fullest potential. Interesting. And um, so there's there's the respect for people has three things. You know, it's all the manners and uh, the other the other part of it is make the the the, the work a place where they extract joy. Not where they have to come, but where they want to come, where they can sure. contribute. And the third thing is where they can grow and develop. And um, I, I, I detail all three of those things in, in both of my books about, about workforce engagement. And uh, when, you, when you work in a Japanese facility, you can see that. You can see okay. that. So, Lonnie, we're going to focus a little bit here. I, I believe that your slides are uh, about the learning model maturity cycle. Uh, I think you're going to share with us how it impacts employee engagement, company culture, and manufacturing. Am I, am I right in that? Yes, yes. All right, fantastic. Well, if you want to pull that up, um, sure. let's let's get that shown off here. I'm excited to see what it is. Good. Okay. Well, the, the, the topic is learning your way to success. And are you creating, could you hold it right there? Are you mm -hmm. creating a learning environment? Is your culture a learning environment? Now, th there's a lot of words to this. So please just listen. And if you want, I'll send you a whole set of the slides so you can have this. But I've come to learn that the short-term vitality and the long-term survival of businesses are inextricably tied to their ability to solve problems. Whatever business you are in, the only sustainable competitive advantage is to improve faster than your competition. To improve faster, you must make intelligent changes quicker than the competition. And that all starts with the ability to learn more quickly than your competition. Hence, the gateway quality to success and survival is based on a simple principle. You must change, you must learn faster than your competition. And, and hence, do you have a learning culture? Do you really right. have a learning culture? We're going to talk about the various parts of a learning culture as we go through this. Could you take us to the next slide? Yep. Yep. Okay. 
And and learning has a lot to do with the stuff in your head. Okay, that's okay. Go ahead. And there we go. Hold it there for just a sec. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I've I've adapted this from from Russell Acuff's model, what he calls the D I K U W model. And what's the stuff in your head? Okay. So if you could if you could just hit the tabs as we go through this, data is is uh, well on the x axis we have the usefulness of the stuff in your head. And on, on the y-axis, we have how big that information is, okay? Okay. And data is just symbols that have a meaning of, of something to you, okay? Black marks on white paper, okay? Information is data that's useful, okay? Somebody might say, well, okay, today we made 250 widgets. Well, that's just a number. But the mm-hmm. information is our goal was 280, and we didn't make our goal. Now you have some information. You can do something with with that, with those numbers, with those symbols, knowledge is really in its simplest form theory. Can you explain okay. things? Okay, understanding is one higher level of of on the continuum, and it's once you understand it, can you now apply it? Mm. Okay, so now you start to talk about taking this knowledge and making it work in the environment that you have, and finally, the highest form of the stuff in your brain is wisdom. And wisdom is is the ability to distinguish and make trade-offs and changes. Understanding knowledge, information, and data are all have to do with efficiency. Wisdom has to do with effectiveness, making the right choices at the right time and the right trade-offs. Okay. Got it. Go ahead. Now, the the only content in the mind that gives us the ability to evaluate and make trade-offs is wisdom. Okay. Now, Mm -hmm. given that stuff in your head, there's a reality we have to deal with. So if you could hit the next slide, Jim. And and that that has to do with a a phenomenon called the Dunning-Kruger effect. I don't know if many of you may have run across this, but Dunning and Kruger did a study, and they found out that the people who were most confident in their Mm -hmm. understanding of a system were the people who, A, had the least experience, and B, the people who had the most experience. Okay? And so if you could, if you could, tweak through it there's some and so when you have very little knowledge you say hey this is a piece of cake i get it no problem okay and and as you go on you say you you do get a little bit more experience and things don't work out exactly as as you thought and you say ooh some of this might be a little tricky you do some more and you say gosh this is tougher finally you get to the trough of this and you say how does anybody learn all this stuff okay <laughs> finally you practice and you keep working at it and you study and you reflect and pretty soon you start to get a grasp on it and finally, you get an understanding of most of it. Yeah. But if you notice, the Dunning-Kruger effect never goes back up to 100%. Yeah. Because That's now wild. you are burdened with knowing what you do not know. Your knowledge is, is, is tempered with humility. Okay. And, and Dunning-Kruger did all kinds of stuff. It's been highly criticized as a theory because I don't think they did statistical studies. But as a model to predict behavior, it's excellent. It's absolutely yeah. excellent. And we're going to talk about the two extremes of the Dunning-Kruger effect and how it affects knowledge and how it affects the, the work environment. If we can advance, Jim. Okay. So let's get back to learning theory. Okay. Um, the learning maturity model is, is, is built on, on four quadrants. And the first one is what we call unconscious incompetence. In other words, you don't know what you don't know. Okay. And if you do take some action, it's based on incorrect intuition. As we advance and and we get out of this area, we start getting into the area of conscious incompetence. Now we know some stuff, but we also know we don't know. A huge step in consciousness. Okay, In that area, action is usually based on what we call incorrect analyses. As you traverse that and become more competent, you go into conscious competence. And that's the rarefied world of you know what you know and you know what you don't know. Mm. Okay. Now, from there, there's a more elegant piece of competence, and it's called unconscious competence. Uh, And and this is the world of, of, um, it, it applies to managers, it applies to a lot of people. Very often, certain people have a certain amount of competence in the in the area that's unconscious. But like, think of yourself out on the battlefield and you're a tank commander. Sure. 
you can't get everybody together and say, what do you think we ought to do? You got to make decisions. Okay. Yeah. And so those people get to that area of having unconscious competence where they just know what to do under the circumstances. We're going to talk a bunch about that. That's a, a fun area, but it's, well, it's a fun area to some people. To other people, it's a nightmare. Okay? Yeah. So let's, and, and the, the irony of all of this is that the highest levels of, of competence are unconscious and the lowest levels of, of, <laughs> of yeah. competence, incompetent, are also unconscious. Okay. So I, I don't know if you're going to get into this, Lonnie, but where, where do most people fall in uh, uh, to this, this model? Okay. It, it, I, don't, what, I don't know how to say most people, but a lot of people are really in the area of, of, um, of conscious incompetence. Okay. But basically, they're learning. They're actively learning. Okay. Sure. And and uh, the people who are in the world of conscious competence are, I mean, these are experts. These are people who really know what they're doing. Most of the people, I think, are in that orange quadrant. Okay? Got it. Maybe to the right or maybe to the left. But we'll talk about what it takes to be able to do, to, to traverse the orange, co the, the orange area uh, in a lean manufacturing sense. Okay. Great. Now, I want to put a caveat here. And that is, I'm talking about learning model where the learning relates and ends up in behavior. Okay. If, if you and I are going to study astrophysics, you know, unlikely that we're going to travel to a star, you know, mm -hmm. so we, we may never have any physical, tangible understanding of it. We'll have an intellectual understanding and we can mm -hmm. explain the theory and stuff like that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking okay. about competence in the area where, where behavior is affected, where change need to be implemented in, in the workshop in the office, in, in the, in the, actually in the classroom as well. Okay? Sure. But as we traverse this, and I'm glad you asked that question, Jim, because there's a real danger zone that we must deal with. Okay. So if you could advance the slide, okay, we can, here's, here we can see the model. Okay. So if you'll hit it a couple of times there, we'll show this danger zone. And this danger zone is what I call the pseudo competence area. Okay. Okay. And we're going to break it down in just a second, but it's really dangerous. And we need to emphasize it. Okay. And the problem with it is that here people very often in this pseudo competence area sound like, act like, and even believe, like the Dunning Kruger effect tells us, they are competent, but they're really not. Okay? Got it. And so, and, and it's an extremely dangerous area for the powerful. Mm. And and I'll relate a quick story with you. When when I was writing one book, I, I called up my, my mentor, Toshi, and I said, hey, Toshi, I want to spend some time with you. I got some questions I want to cultivate before I write this book. You got some time. So I mm -hmm. traveled to Marysville, Ohio, and I spent three days with him. And Toshi and I had breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And, and by the time, I think he was really tired of me But mm -hmm. by the time we finished. But um, I was talking to him, and I had this concept of what I called the 10 lean killers. And lean killer number one, lean killer number one, the things that prevent a lean transformation from progressing is uh, inadequate domain critical knowledge by the senior management. Okay. Interesting. They, they understand the, the spreadsheets. They understand the profit and loss. They understand all the maps of the territory, but they don't necessarily understand the territory itself. Mm. So I was talking to Toshi about this and I asked him and, 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 his, his response was really impressive because he, he got this funny look on his forehead, a funny look on his face, pardon me. His forehead crinkled up a little bit. And he said, Lonnie, I just do not understand how these managers believe they can help their people. Mm. Now, when you talk about managers having domain critical knowledge, you think about can they make the decisions to write the, the, the right material? Can sure. they make the decisions to buy the right machinery? Can they make the decisions of how to deal with the customers? We always think of technical issues. Yeah. That was not Toshi's thought. His Toshi, his thought immediately defaulted to people. How can they help their people? And one of the one of the things we teach in our in our supervisory training is that the primary job of a supervisor is to work and make his people successful. Okay. 
That makes and sense. And if every supervisor makes all their people successful, pretty soon everybody's going to be successful because in an organization, everybody has a supervisor. Yeah. But it showed to me the distinct difference between Western thinking and I don't want to say Eastern thinking, but in this case, Japanese thinking. Sure. I get in trouble for using those terms, but um, <laughs> I've been in trouble I'll, before. I'll, I'll hold you to task if you say anything that is uh, shouldn't be said. Okay, okay. But to deal with this danger zone, we need to expand our awareness. So if you can advance the slide, I've taken this this slide. Oops, pardon me. I want to digress for a second. Uh, no, that's fine. Advance okay. the slide. My problem. Um, way back when I was in a Bible study class, and uh, in this Bible study class, they were talking about Genesis and, and when God created man. And somebody said, well, God, he created man in his image. What does that mean? Well, this is 19... 88 or 1990, I think. And, and I was the only one who had any serious Bible study software. And the internet was, was in its infancy. So there, it was tough to sure. search. So I became the, the, the research person in our, in our group. And uh, so I, I read it and I reread it and I reread it and I reread it and I, I, I searched as much as I could. And I came to the conclusion that the author of Genesis was talking about the comparison of man to animals because he just hmm. created animals. Now he creates man. Okay. And so I said, okay, so what's the difference? Okay. And I said that animals react reflexively. When you give them a stimulus, you kick a dog, they either bite you or they run. Okay. They don't think about it. Okay. It's reflexive. It's only, you call it an instinct. Okay. Could you hit the, hit the next button? Yep. But man has the ability to deliberate. And in that short instant between s stimulus and response, it might be just a fraction of a second. Sure. Or it could be, you know, 10 days. But in that window of time, we have the ability to exhibit awareness, which is basically thinking about thinking. Okay. And when we think about it, now we can conjure up op options. Okay. With uh, imagine and create imagination and creativity. Now we've got to say, okay, what are the right things? Mm -hmm. So we use conscious-driven values to make a decision or not, okay? And ultimately, we have choice, okay? Right. And I call those the four gifts from God. Those are four things that we have that animals really don't have. Sure. Okay? And ultimately, they lead to response, and the response ends up being either a natural or a social response, okay? and it. it can be both. Uh, and so I call awareness the gateway quality. The more aware you are, the more options you can have, the more values you can apply, the better choices you can make. Okay. So we, we teach a lot about awareness, how to improve awareness. Now hold it right there for just a second. Nope. Okay. I want to read this. And again, don't read with me. Please just, just listen. But awareness is more than seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and feeling. Okay. We call that observation. Okay. Awareness is all of that, plus the state of being alert and watchful as well as being well-informed of not only what's happening now, but what could happen as a result of what you do. That's what yeah. awareness is about, okay? And, and so awareness is a much greater topic than just observation. Okay? Interesting. And awareness plays, plays greatly into our learning model. Let's go ahead. Okay. Let's, let's dissect our learning model now, Jim. Okay. So as we go from unconscious competence to conscious incompetence, we, we go into this area this, this danger zone. So if you could mm -hmm. tweak the slide there, Jim. Okay. We can't forget about the danger zone. It's incredibly important. Okay. And again. Okay. So I've shrunk these, these two areas so we can expand the danger zone. And if you, if you hit the slide once. When you, when you get out of this area of an unconscious incompetence, people like to look, sound like they know what they're doing. And so. So sometimes people will capture the jargon and they will get some level of belief that they really understand it. Mm -hmm. okay? it it's kind of like the next step is to, to work with the theory. Hold it right there for just a second. Mm -hmm. and, and, and now you have a seems to be environment that's a little bit more solid. Okay. Now, these are the two things that every Monday morning quarterback has. <laughs> yeah. 
And everybody's a Monday morning quarterback. Well, if the coach had only run on third down instead of passing, you know. Absolutely. The coach called 80 offensive plays, you know. And somebody <laughs> feels well-armed to criticize him on the one, you know, that didn't work out quite well. Okay? Mm -hmm. But once you learn the jargon and you can talk about the theory a little bit, very often you sound like you know what you're doing. You seem to be in the know. You Got seem it. to be knowledgeable. Okay. Now, if you can then hit the button, please, if you can then go out and observe it in maybe somebody else's plan, now you've got some tangible evidence, and you can talk to people about that, and sure. you can sound like you know what you're doing, okay? But it's a little bit like I, I used to tell people, for some reason, when I was growing up, um, I always thought I'd be a father, and I thought fatherhood was cool. And when I was about 20 or 22, I think I had fatherhood nailed down. And what I tell people now was, I did. I had the perfect answers for any given circumstance, right up until I had to do it. <laughs> and then when I had to do it, all of a sudden, I got a real dose of humility. Okay? Sure. And, and that's where so many managers are. They understand the theory. And they think they, they have a grasp of it. But this is a dangerous place. Okay? Mm -hmm. If you advance the one more time. Okay? And this is what I call where they have incipient awareness. Maybe they can initiate a few things, but really they can't go very deep into change. Okay. And so the, the mental models aren't mature and that type of stuff. And management often gets stuck in this danger zone. Okay. And what happens very often is two or three or four of the guys on the C-suite will read the same book and then mm -hmm. they'll start talking about it. Okay. And pretty soon they will reinforce one another and they get to the point where they actually believe they understand it. And it just okay. becomes an echo chamber at that leadership yes. level. Yes. Yeah. And it's, it's incredibly dangerous because they have all this power. Okay? Yeah. And they that don't yet have the awareness of what the, the, uh, the awareness that they need. Okay. Yeah. So if you could hit the slide again. Okay. And, and this is what I call the make or break point. Okay. Up to this point, I'll, I'll explain it in just a little bit. Uh, we, we've really captured knowledge. We understand the theory, but right. we don't have understanding. <laughs> we've captured the knowledge. We understand the theory. What a horrible sentence. We've captured the knowledge and we have a, 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 a working model in our, in our mind of how it, how it should behave. But we sure. do not have understanding. Got understanding it. comes by applying it in this behavioral related stuff. Okay. So this is what I call the make or break point. And what management does, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. You're right. What management does from that point becomes very important. And again, hit another, hit it again, please, Jim. And you gain the understanding by applying it. Mm -hmm. By applying it. And usually the application starts out with what I call muddling through. You find some small area and you say, well, let's apply this out here. And you make it work. Okay. And then once you make it work, you say, oh, geez, how are we going to perpetuate this? Well, we have to create a standard. We have to document the process. We have to have metrics, etc. Okay. So you create a standard for that specific environment in that beta site that you're working in, that small, whether it's a workstation or a cell or maybe in a value stream. It shouldn't mm -hmm. be a plan. That's a horrible way to muddle through. <laughs> But ultimately, when you get this standard and you start working with it, now you can execute this standard and you can sustain it. At that point, you have documented not just knowledge, but an understanding for that circumstance. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so it might be a specific application in a, in a work cell, or it might be a specific application in a workstation. Okay. But you now have working knowledge. Why? Because you've made it work. Okay. And as we're going through this model of muddling through, creating a standard and, and sustaining and executing, we, we teach what we call the initiative mantra. In other words, they, 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 they get at the, at the beginning and they say, geez, there's a million things that can go wrong. What should we do? Well, forget about that. Start where you are, use what you got, and do what you can. Got it. And then we teach them the, the thing which is we call the problem-solving mantra. And that is, don't try to eat an, eat an elephant in one bite. <laughs> you know, think small, think fast, and think lots of cycles to the PDACA cycle yeah. for, for two fundamental reasons. One, as soon as you change something, 
whatever your initial conditions were are now going to change. Yeah. Okay. And the second thing is you're going to learn. Yep. So you're going to have more knowledge to, to base it on. Okay. And, and then the third mantra is how do you get it sustained? Well, you create the standard, you make it visual. You've, the concept of the visual factory. Okay. Yep. From there, you, you, you train the standard. You make sure everybody understands it and you make the training visual. Okay. Mm-hmm. Then you execute the standard. You make it visual as well. Okay. And ultimately, you reflect on where you are and improve. Okay? I like it. So now our our learning model says, if we really want to learn, we've got to apply. Mm -hmm. Now, here is where we we very often lose the management. Okay. And and they think this lean transformation is all about what happens on the floor. And, And we say, well, wait a minute. Don't you have some management processes as well? Well, like, what are you talking about? I say, well, what about personnel? Uh, appraisal and development what about hiring what about training what about staffing onboarding. and organizing yeah. do we have the, pardon me what i said onboarding yeah sure exactly do we have good programs for that and they say well I don't. it turns out the very most important processes you have are controlled by management sure and yet at this point management is not very anxious to get involved and apply it they want everybody else to apply it they see it happening on the floor. They want to fix everybody on the floor. They want to fix everything on the floor. Okay? Mm-hmm. But let me tell you, there's opportunities everywhere. And the biggest <laughs> opportunities are in the boardroom. Okay. So as we as we get out of this conscious incompetence area, and as we transformed over to the right, we're getting more and more competent. Okay. And and when we get into this area of conscious competence, okay, we get there only one way. And Taichi Ono said it best. He said, you learn the Toyota production system by practicing it and in no other way. Sure. You can't read about it and really learn and apply it. Yep. Okay. You can't have people teach it to you. You have to take all of that, that reading, that teaching, that observing, and then go out and apply it. Okay. And so then when you're done with this, now you've got some, what I call local understanding. You may know how to apply it in that work cell or in that value stream or maybe even in that plant okay but that's not good enough okay that's not good enough because now you you've got different cells you've got different value streams you've got different um locations and you'll find out there's a difference as you go to apply them yeah you're you're working with a bigger system you've got new new variables okay and so if you hit the slide one more time there okay what you find out is that you, understanding has to do with applying in what we call the containing environment. If the containing environment is a work cell, that's a small environment. Mm-hmm. If it's a value stream, that's a bigger environment. If it's a plant, that's an even bigger environment. If it's a corporation, that's a bigger environment. Sure. If it's a whole industry, that's a bigger environment. And there is no end to how, how large the environment can be. Sure. Okay? But the way you, you, you go from conscious competence to unconscious competence is through practice. There is no other way. And Got it's it. not just practice. It's perfect practice. Hmm. You have to do it and you have to do it well. And then you, you, you literally transfer the neurons in your brain. You create bit brain patterns. Okay. Mm-hmm. And what happens is pretty soon you can do it reflexively. Got it. Okay, so if you advance the slide there just a second, okay, and and at this point, you, you're usually most people get to be pretty humble because they know what they know, and and they also know there's things they don't know, and they also know in the bigger system there's things they don't know, mm-hmm. and so they're you become quite humble if you're actually very good at it, <laughs> and which is kind of odd because it becomes kind of the quiet meat guy. Okay, but then when you get to the rarefied era of unconscious competence, this is just an amazing place to be. I could tell you a couple of stories about some experiences I've had, but we don't have time today. But maybe maybe later, you and I can we'll get do a we'll here. do a second episode, uh, a follow up here because this is fascinating to me, to, uh, Lonnie. I, I think this is great. Unconscious competence is what I call the Willie Mays syndrome. So if you could hit the the button there once, 
Now, I don't know if, if you remember Willie Mays. I don't know if you're old enough to remember Willie Mays, Jim, but hold it right there for just a sec, please. Yeah. But, but Willie Mays was what I think is one of the greatest baseball players of all time. Okay. He could do all five things that Leo DeRocher talked about. He could, he could run, he could throw, he could hit for power, he could hit for, uh, hit for average, and he could play defense. Okay? Mm -hmm. And he did all of them excellently. Well, late in his career, he got to be kind of a pain in the ass because he didn't want to retire, but he wasn't very skillful. And, okay. and the Giants, the San Francisco Giants, had traded him to the New York Mets, but they, they really couldn't put him out on the field. He just wasn't good enough anymore. So they made him a batting instructor. And he was, by all records, the absolute worst batting instructor in all of history. <laughs> he could not explain anything to anybody. You know, the, the ball would come and he'd say, well, swing the bat and hit the damn thing, you know? <laughs> and they'd say, well, you know, he'd say, what's wrong? You know, and there's no way he could explain it because he never had to think about it. He Got was it. just good at it, you know? Yep. And, and, and people like that can't explain it. So if you'll hit the button once there, these people in this area of unconscious competence are just outstanding doers. They can solve your problems. They can fix things. You, you bring them in and you say, Jim, I want you to take care of this. And they say, okay, now just get Done. out of my way and I'll do it. Okay. Yep. And you hit the button again. So consequently, strong managers love these people. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, they got two downsides. They're an insecure manager's nightmare. Jim, how did you know what to do? I don't know. I just did it. Well, I can't tell the boss. My, my, my <laughs> chief problem solver doesn't know, you know. Right. And so an insecure manager is really intimidated by these type of people and they don't like them. They don't. And the last thing is, if you hit the bit button one more time, they are usually lousy teachers <laughs> because they, they, they haven't really had to work through it. it it's something that kind of comes naturally to them. Yeah. And, and they're like Willie Mays, a horrible yep. teacher. OK, so if you if you hit the button again, we can we can go on from there. So. Now I want to take this whole learning model and look at it and talk about it in terms of the stuff in your brain and how it fits to these areas areas, and how you can look at those from a cultural concept and say, where are we? Or where's this group? Okay. Mm -hmm. And so if you, if you look at the unconscious competence area, hit that a couple of times. Okay. This is the world of data and information. Okay. Managers have all the data. They have all the information, okay? Uh, the numbers, okay? And knowledge starts when you start to get out of that area. This is where you start to understand the theory. Uh, and you always got to learn the jargon just so you can talk to other people, okay? Mm -hmm. But you really don't start to become competent, okay? Until you, you vault into the in, unconscious incompetence area. And that's where understanding starts, and then as you practice it and practice it and practice it and practice it, you can gain wisdom, but you don't get wisdom out of a book. Okay. And finally, you get to the rarefied world of unconscious competence. Okay. And hit the button one more time. Oops. Okay. And so if we want to take a look at this from 30,000 feet, just go ahead and hit it three times. When we're over here in the bottom left, you know, we're coalescing data, information, and knowledge, okay? As we, as we get up to the area of higher consciousness, consciousness, now we're growing our knowledge into understanding through practice, and finally, we're transforming understanding into wisdom, okay? Now, a lot of people never get to the wisdom phase. I mean, if you had a lot of those people, that would be great, okay? Yeah. But you don't. And, and, and we have things in our system that prevent it. Like, as soon as they get competent, we want to ship them over someplace else. Yeah. And, uh, and so there's, there's all kinds of things that, that get in the way of, of really creating wisdom. Okay. But at the 30,000 foot level, let's look at it. Let's look at the awareness spectrum. This is the one that I think is incredibly important. Um, not only that awareness is the gateway quality. Okay. But how do you spot it? And what do you do about it? Okay. So if you if you hit the button once, okay, and and we're going to go around this so you can just as I finish talking about one hit the other one, when you're when you're in the unconscious incompetence area at the lowest level you're unaware of your unawareness you don't know that you don't know, 
Okay? Mm -hmm. When you get to incipient awareness, the data and the, in the, and the information start to make sense to you. And you, you start to say, well, okay, there's something wrong with this or there's something wrong with that. Okay? Mm -hmm. As you go beyond that, okay, and, and you, you transfer, transform this pseudo-confidence, pseudo-competence, pardon me, okay, you, you start to get an improving system awareness through study and observation. But at this point, you only have knowledge. You understand the theory, okay? Mm -hmm. And so you, you have what I call quasi-usable awareness, okay? Now, as you transform and you go, go further along in the model, pretty soon as you go, as you transfer across this conscious incompetence area, you start to get applicable awareness. You, you really know what you're doing, okay? And, and finally, when you transfer out of it, now you understand what that system is capable of doing. You have an awareness of what that system is capable of doing and what it's not capable of doing as well. Yeah. Okay? And then as you, as you transfer further along, okay, you get what I call local environmental awareness. Keep in, keep in mind that the difference between knowledge and understanding is taking the theory and applying it in your environment. Well, wherever you are, you have a local environment, might be the cell. You also have a global environment. A bigger one, yep. Value stream or the plan, okay. Mm -hmm. And you need to have additional skills and do additional work to to kind of cross that barrier into into a global understanding. And and ultimately, you get down here to unconscious con competence, where literally you are unaware of your awareness. <laughs> you just you know like like Willie Mays, he didn't know why you couldn't hit right. it. He just knew you couldn't, you know, <laughs> and I, I call it the awareness paradox in that the the weakest and the strongest part of awareness are both unconscious. Yeah. Unconscious unawareness and unconscious awareness. Now, in just a second, we'll talk about a quote from Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes that kind of makes sense of that. At least it did to me. Yeah. Um, but so let's go ahead. Oh, here it is. He said, I don't give a fig for the simplicity on this side of complexity, but I would die for the simplicity on the other side. <laughs> and what he's saying is like the Dunning-Kruger effect. You know, people think it's simple until they get involved with it and have to do all the details and apply it in the environment. But then right. when they do understand the details and they know how to apply it in the environment, now once again, it becomes simple but at a completely different level of understanding. Wow. Okay. And um, so if we, if we look at that on the awareness spectrum, okay, hit the button twice, please. Okay. He, all, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes said, simplicity on the near side of complexity. It's this point over here, this point on the danger zone that we called um, the make or break point. Yeah. Okay. Do managers say this is simple and quit working? If they Got do, it. the lean initiative, the culture change initiative, the learning initiative, whatever it happens to be, the problem solving initiative stops at that point mm -hmm. to the extent that it requires management attention or anybody attention. This doesn't apply to just management. This applies to all kinds of people. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you, I hate to say this because I always get, get in trouble with my peers, but there's a bunch of consultants who are right there. Yep. But they sound like they know what they're talking about. They can yep. spew the theory. Okay. They can give you example after example after example. But the key question is, please tell me what you've done. Right. And and when you find out they haven't done much, well, I saw this or Harry did this or whatever, it's that now all of a sudden their their knowledge it has a different level. It's no longer yep. understanding, it's just knowledge. Okay. And, and I one think more that's what gives uh, a, a lot of consultants a bad name, right? The ones who are maybe at this point um, versus that first point. Yeah, exactly. But but those those people who have this understanding on the far side of, of complexity, in other words, they've gone through the details, they've sorted through the wheat and, and the chaff, and they know what the wheat looks like. Yeah. Okay. And that's what he means by the far side of complexity. And it's those people who have, who have traveled the journey, so to speak. Yeah. Okay? And, and I, I love that quote because I, I there's so many one. people 
who sound like they know what they're doing. Okay. And to be honest with you, it's given my whole profession of, of lean, lean uh, implementation consultants a bad name okay. because there's a lot of people out there who, who over promised and then under deliver. Yep. Absolutely. Probably in every field. Okay. Yes. Okay. Summarizing all of this as it relates to culture and stuff is to survive and thrive. We need to cultivate a culture of learning. Okay. And the learning is in that model. Okay. But learning has different meanings to different people. Okay. Then we must manage the culture. So we learn faster than our competition. How do we do that? Well, the way we do that is you get these managers through the danger zone. Mm -hmm. When the managers get through the danger zone, they will be great models and other people will follow them. Okay. And it's based on an awareness of what we can do and, and predict predominantly management awareness. Now I get in a lot of trouble because you say the managers are the problem, the managers are the problem, the managers are the problem. And I like to say it the other way around. I say the managers are the solution. Uh, I like that. When they do this, things happen. Yeah. You know, it's, it's just like dad at the dinner table. If dad has terrible manners, his kids are going to have terrible manners. Okay. And if he then criticizes them for having terrible manners, the kids initially are going to say, but dad, you're a slob too. You know, <laughs> you do the same thing. Yep. Yeah. And then pretty soon as he takes them out behind the barn and whips them a couple of times, they quit telling him, <laughs> but that doesn't change the reality. Right. The same dynamics happened in the workplace, the same, almost identical. Yep. Okay. And, a lot of what we need to do to create a learning culture is dependent upon distinguishing intellectual knowledge from applicable understanding. Mm. We want to get to the point where we have applicable understanding and we can actually change the behavior and get Got the it. behaviors that we want. Okay. I like it. And, and so to do that, we must thoroughly appreciate these differences and learn how to negotiate the danger zone. The danger zone is the key because the managers are so powerful. They're so influential. Yeah. If they're doing things right, the rest of the place is going to be doing things right, by and large. If they're doing things wrong, the only tools that they have is position power to make things happen. Yep. They can be autocratic. And again, yep. all of this, all of this is gained by, by practice by working, mm -hmm. by doing it, and in no other way. Uh, this is my last slide, and I want to leave you with a, a parting thought. And it's one of my favorite quotes from T.S. Eliot. And he says, hit it one more time, please. He says, we must not cease from exploration. And the end of all exploration will be to arrive where we began and to know that place for the first time. Hmm. That's deep. I yeah. like that. I, I read that the first time and I said, wow. <laughs> so I, I guess I have another slide here, my, my paid advertisements. But <laughs> um, so so thank you and be well. Okay. And at this point, I, I have all of most of this explained in my book called The Science of Workforce Engagement. It's on Amazon. But let me make one thing clear. Uh, I make a deal with everyone I call a student. Okay. And Jim, now you and everybody who listens to this podcast is a student. Okay. And anyone who's ever a student of mine is always a student of mine. And what that means is see that contact information? Give me a call. Send me a text. Send me like an it. email. And and we'll talk about it. Okay. If I think you're you're chewing up so much of my time, uh, then uh, then then maybe I'll say, hey, time out. We need to get into consulting mode here. <laughs> but uh, that that has happened once in 32 years. So, so uh, wonderful. Well, that was Bonnie, that was amazing. I like that. That was a, a great model um, and something that makes complete sense. Um, but unconsciously i didn't know about it i mean to use what some of the terms that you you're using on there right it was maybe uh unconsciously incompetent about that um or uh, <laughs> uh but i i actually uh, as you were talking 
um, was able to map out my journey uh, as a, a cultural consultant, right? And, and where I am in the Dunning Kruger effect, and where I am in the continuum, and and in the the maturity model, um, uh, or or the maturity cycle. Um, when I when I started this journey, uh, I was filled with theoretical knowledge and a lot of information about uh, culture um, based on some of my experiences, um, but my experience is more as middle level management instead of high level management, senior management, right? Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> so uh, a lot of my go-to-market strategy has changed over the last two years uh, as I've been in having this consulting uh, or, or doing the consulting full time. A and uh, they've changed as I've hit different parts of that cycle. And I was never able to really say why I was changing my go to market strategy. <clears throat> but it was very obvious now that I've looked through and you've explained this, it's very obvious to me why I was changing. And that's because I was going from unconscious incompetence into uh, it, uh, conscious incompetence. And, and now I'm somewhere in between, I think, uh, with my latest iteration of go to market on my consulting, uh, the, the, the top two, the, the orange and the yellow there. Um, but I, I really, I, I can't thank you enough, Lonnie. That was uh, an, an amazing uh, journey you just took us on. So thank you. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And one of the things that a lot of people don't realize, a lot of people talk about culture, but what a lot of people really don't appreciate is so much of the culture is in itself unconscious. Sure. And and the behaviors of the people, you know, you, you say, well, why do you wear a, you know, a shirt and tie to work? And well, that's how we've always done it, you know, and right. say, well, does it make sense, you know? And 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 ultimately, you come down to the the answer of what culture is. Somebody will say, "Well, well, that's just how we do things around here," you know. And and to me, that's what I call the operational definition of culture. It's just okay. how we do things around here. Yeah. And uh, a lot of people don't understand it, but but when the culture is very strong and very healthy, it can be really powerful, particularly in yeah. terms of the ways you communicate and stuff like that. And 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 that's one of the things I found from my my Japanese friends is that I will talk to them about, why do you do this? Yeah. And and they they look at me and say, why not? You know, and it's dramatically different than a yeah. lot of, of Western Western behaviors. And and um and I think that's one of the reasons why the 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 lean movement has really stifled is that there's so much of this cultural issue that has to do with how the Japanese treat their people. And as compared to how Western in Western culture, how we Americans and, and Mexicans and South Americans and Canadians treat our people, there, there's a difference. There's a distinct difference. And yeah. uh, and one of the things is they just do a better job in engagement. Sure. Absolutely. You can see it. And, you know, you, you hear about, well, the Japanese have this. This. It's not every place and it's not like a national standard. But very often they have what they call employment for life. Got it. And and here in the states, you know, you work for a company three or four years. That's that's a good term, you know. Right. Ten years and twenty years with the company now is almost unheard of. Absolutely. But there they do it for life. Well, that gives them an advantage to, to opportunity to grow and develop and culture these and uh, and grow these people and and get the best out of them. Yep. And uh, so it's. A lot of culture is just unconscious behavior, and people don't really understand it. Uh, they just feel it, so to speak. Yeah. Everybody's got a culture, whether they know it or not, right? Exactly. Exactly. Because at the end of the day, it is just how we do things around here. <laughs> yep. Uh, we're we're going to have to do a second episode, Lonnie. Um, my my view of culture is it's simply the, the alignment of values between the organization and, and its employees. 
Um, so I'd love to have a, a conversation with you, dive deeper into uh, your definition of culture, my defini definition of culture, and uh, where they they meet and how uh, how it works. Right. Uh, so let's sure. let's work on scheduling that. We'll probably do that. Uh, uh, I'll have to look at my schedule for twenty four, um, but we'll we'll find a, a time to get that air, uh, out there. Uh, but thank you again, Lonnie. Uh, folks, that's a wrap on today's episode of the Manufacturing Culture Podcast. Lonnie has taken us on a journey that was absolutely a masterclass into the heart of cultural transformation and the power of lean manufacturing. Uh, he shared with us a little bit about his 20 years at Chevron to starting quality consultants. Uh, Lonnie has truly shown us what it means to embrace the respect for people philosophy and how it can revolutionize the way we think about workforce engagement. Remember, if you're inspired to learn more about Lonnie's approach and explore his wealth of knowledge, visit his website, qc-ep.com. All of his insight strategies and tips are literally just a click away waiting to help you transform your company's culture. Uh, and of course, a massive thank you again to our sponsor, Speroni, for their ongoing support. Their commitment to the manufacturing community is unparalleled, and we're grateful for their partnership in bringing this podcast to life. Now, don't forget to hop over to manufacturingculturepodcast.com for more episodes and exclusive content. This is your one-stop destination for all things manufacturing culture. We'd love for you to share this episode with your friends, colleagues, anyone passionate about culture manufacturing and the intersection of the two spread the word and let's keep this conversation going while you're at it please 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 take a moment to rate and review our show on whatever podcast platform you're listening on uh the those ratings those reviews help us reach more people because the more you rate and review the more i pop up the show pops up uh, when people search for terms like manufacturing or culture uh, your feedback also helps us grow and continue bringing you the content that you've come to love and, and thank you very much for being with us again for another one uh, another episode uh, thanks for tuning in remember transforming company culture starts with you stay inspired stay engaged and we'll see you next time on the Manufacturing Culture Podcast. Keep making things and manufacturing greatness. Have a great day.